Hello and welcome to another episode of the Saints FC podcast. Once again, as always, you can get in contact with the show and we do love receiving your correspondence. You can email us, saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet us at saintsfcpodcast. And there's another way that you can get in contact, which I've not mentioned before, um, but it's actually by commenting on videos on YouTube. Uh, So for those of you who don't know, um, the Ugly Inside has a fantastic YouTube channel. The Ugly Inside being the, the fanzine from the 1980s and throughout so my entire was a brilliant fanzine, yeah. Life, yeah. That was great. Um, so they have a YouTube channel. Uh, I think Arsenal Fan TV, but much, much more cultured, obviously. And um, they paste all of our podcasts up there. So you can actually now leave a comment there. Um, I'm going to read out a comment from Dave Beach, who listened to the last episode. Um, He says he used to live in Southampton, and like Dan, who we mentioned on the episode before, uh, he now lives in the USA in a place called Spokane in Washington. I said that in an Australian accent, didn't it, I, rather than American? Yeah, you kind of you kind of panicked. Yeah. <laughs> um, he says the last game he saw uh, was at the Dale back in 1982. Uh, he loves the podcast. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, nice to say that. Uh, great job, guys. Just saw us loose to Palace. Do you guys think that all the players that we have sold has caught up with us? I was watching the games during the holiday break, and almost all of the top teams have more than one ex-Southampton player. In short, the Liverpool Everton game the other night just seemed like a Southampton eleven. Yeah, um, I imagine that could well have been one of the games that he's watched over the holiday season. It was. It, it, it was rather upsetting, wasn't it? Seeing all of these, players. but not all of the players that have left Southampton have have done necessarily better in the way that they are as players. Um, I, I think a lot have gone to you know bigger clubs. I think we can say that, um, but have kind of remained the same player i don't think many of Mane probably aside of many have really like kicked on yeah i suppose gareth bale kicked on he's we're going he back quite a long while technically that, has kicked on i yeah, think yeah yeah <laughs> i think we'll we'll let him have that one um but yeah it's an interesting point from dave i mean no doubt that selling your players season after season of course disrupts the the squad and um you know it, like southampton are never you know without uh, an incredibly wealthy sugar daddy ever going to be like a you know, Manchester City, Manchester United, Liverpool or, or whatever. Um, so really we've got to look at the kind of like Leicester City method of winning the title has been the way. Yep, by the way. And, and I think one of the things with Leicester is that side stay together, um, you know, through promotion up to the Premier League. They fought together as part of a relegation battle and they were, they were like a good old band of brothers when they won the title. And really it's kind of like all the disruption after winning the title with all the transfer stuff that that they've started to go off the boil again and um you know I, i'm sure it has made a difference it would have been great to see like all of those young players who developed from league one you know yeah. through the championship into the premier league stay together for a bit longer but and i think it's, it's consistency isn't it i mean leicester won that league because they were ridiculously consistent from the you know from pretty much from the outset and we i don't think their players are anyone i don't think uh, Jamie Vardy's probably any better than Shane Long. I don't think Morris is probably on his day could, or Booth, any better than Booth out, but they can just do it week in, week out. And our guys right now just don't seem to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, Jamie Vardy was was famously inconsistent before he that, was a, that he title was a winning joke. season. You know, he yeah. was, a, he was a, like a figure of fun footballer. Um, anyway, so we're not here to talk about Leicester City. Um, Dave, t- yeah, I, I do agree with you. We've, we've had a few questions in from um, listeners and we're going to be talking about Saints' fortunes more kind of holistically a bit later on. Um, since the last time we put out a podcast, there's been three fixtures. Well, the last time since we've done a, a kind of review of the Saints' performance, there's been three fixtures, which has been uh, the nil-nil draw against, Ma- against Manchester United, the 2-1 loss against Palace at home, and Saturday's win in the FA Cup at Fulham. So let's tackle this chronologically, but maybe spent you know most of the time speaking about I think Palace and Fulham. So I think that probably tells us more about the yeah. Saints um, than the others. But the Man United game is still interesting. So it was nil nil. Um, yeah, we seem to do quite well at Old Trafford these days. Uh, yeah, I think we've won. Is it for the last five out of six times at Old Trafford we've come away with at least a point, which yeah. is probably a better record than any other, anyone else, really. Yeah, and, and certainly a better record than we've had in, in a long, long time. Um, once again, Saints, you know, they showed up, they played well at Old Trafford without ever really looking like they were going to threaten to win the match, but they stayed competitive 
for the full 90 minutes. And I think they were deserving of the point in the end. Um, obviously, we had Paul Pogba did kick the ball in from an offside position. And actually, if he hadn't touched it, Man United might have won 1-0 because it Silly looked like Paul that was Pogba. going in. It's his ego, isn't it? That's classic Paul Pogba ego. Anyone else? If that had been a humble Stephen Davis, he'd have just left it. Oh, well, you know, there you go. Um, who would you rather have on your side, though, Paul Pogba or Stephen Davis? Stephen Davis, yeah. of course. Well, there we go. Um, so what I think is interesting about Manchester United, and I think um, if we look back across the, the season as a whole, we've had an impressive point against Manchester United. Um, we, we were unlucky in the first game, uh, the first Man United game yeah, of the season. As well. Yeah, that's we true. We probably deserve something from that. And, and at the time, I think Mourinho said that Saints were the best side that his Man United team had come against, uh, come up against at that point in the season. Um, so we lost that one one now. Um, Arsenal, we should have probably beaten them one yeah. nil, but we got a sucker punch of an equaliser from inevitability. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is another thing yeah. that's quite a common thing. We this should just season. record that and put that on a loop, and then you can just push space bar to say a horrible equaliser from a yeah. header. We, just we, we, so we could just get a season. sampler, couldn't we, yeah. of quotes of like, you know, what's going on. And maybe just maybe push. the final <laughs> episode of the season will just go through the sampler and see if anything's changed. It'd be like a cold cut mixtape. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, we've had, we've had the point against Man United, unlucky at St. Mary's against Man United. We had the point against Arsenal, unlucky at St. Mary's, I, I think, you know, certainly deserved uh, to win if we'd stayed a little bit more focused. We're really, really unlucky to lose at the Etihad Stadium against Manchester City, who have been phenomenal this season. Yeah. Um, so heartbreaker, that, that one. It was a real heartbreaker. And again, you know, once again, that was the team playing really, really well. And so it appears... Chelsea as well. Sorry, Chelsea, Marcus yeah. Alonso free kick. We were, we were in that game. Yeah, we were in that game. I mean, Chelsea weren't... I don't think they were as impressive a opposition as perhaps, yeah, you true. know, some of the other sides have been. But... You know, what, what seems to be the case with Pellegrino is that he can set up the side to play quite defensively and be quite effective against one of the big four or five sides in the Premier League. Obviously, with Tottenham and Liverpool matches aside, I think. Yeah, we got murdered. Yeah. So sometimes it, it falls to pieces. But there's enough evidence there to suggest that in that one department of the way that he's managed Saints this season... It's been relatively effective. Unfortunately, we've not had a win from that. And and I think, you know, if you're looking at kind of three or four of your best performances of the season, haven't got you three points, really that the main focus should be on the games that you can win. And I think this this is where Pellegrino falls down under scrutiny. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it is um he seems to me and you know he knows much more about football than of course I ever will but he seems to freeze and when you see decisions like I I watch the games and I think what would I do like we all do and of course he knows much more than me but if we take the Arsenal game you spoke about they stick uh Giroud on and you know what they're going to do at that point you know that they're going to go what they're going to go lump it up to Giroud yeah. And hope that he causes chaos because Yoshida and Stevens are not very good um, defensively in the air. Uh, you know what they're going to do. We've got Hoyt on the bench. Hoyt doesn't come on. Uh, you know, you, you, I don't know if Hoyt would have stopped that goal, but I think he would have had a better chance of getting that ball away than either Yoshida or Stevens. And we talk about the, the the Palace game. He kind of froze again. You know, where you see it will come to the Palace game. He kind of froze. And, and my worry is that, yeah, he's, he can set the team up well. But does he have the flexibility? Does he have the tactical nous that when things aren't going to plan or when things have gone to plan, but he needs to push on, can he do that? Tom, I, I like what you're saying mainly because it chimes with the notes that I've written down for this episode. Great minds. Um, so I've got the 2-1 loss against Paris. And, you know, my notes are saying, you know, good first half. We should have done more to push on and get the second goal. I, I feel like... Um, in that first half, Palace were really, really leggy. They were ragged, weren't yeah. they? I mean, they just had a, a really impressive point against Manchester City. Again, they were unlucky not to to beat Man City. Um, and they'd laid everything down a, a, on that. And so when they showed up at St. Mary's... On it, a terrible pitch, which would have slowed them down and would have made them tired. Yeah, it, it, was, it was clear that Palace were nowhere near full fitness. And, you know, 
I, I don't doubt that, that Saints weren't near full fitness, but it was clear that there was a big difference. The, the extra well, day's had, rest. We'd had more rest yeah. and we've got a bigger squad. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, why we didn't get the second goal, I mean, who, who knows? Um, and then the second half, I've written down, you know, how did we not see it coming? The sense of inevitability. And then I call into question Pellegrino's ability when it comes to in-game management. Yeah, I... I Totally agree. I, I I was watching that at home. I almost threw my laptop against the wall. It, it was so frustrating. You could see as the second half grew on, Palace changed the system. They grew in confidence. Um, they grew in stature when they should have been getting more tired and they should have been there for the taking. We were at home. They kind of realised that much like the Burnley game, you know, we saw at St. Mary's early season, I think opposition realises halfway through the second half that we're there for the taking. Uh, and we're certainly capable of conceding, and uh, and uh, it drove me mad because we we persisted with Buffal and we persisted with I think Tadic on, on one wing, and you could see that Palace's game plan is like get the ball to Zaha, just give it to Wilfred, and uh, and I think it was two things that really showed up. One was that when Pellegrino should have ditched the attacking for ditched the, ditched the attackers, gone to flood the midfield with Stephen Davis and Lamina, and just block that supply line. Lamina, who dominated mm. Palace earlier this season, he didn't do it. But it also showed us something, something about character. And you watch Zaha. Zaha gets kicked around. He gets kicked. He gets up and he says, give me the ball. I will go again. Our guys, they don't. And I is there something about character there as well that we're missing? Is, uh, character on the pitch and leadership off it. I, I, I think you're right to call, you know, call up the... the the idea of the character of the squad because the amount of games where we've looked like we're completely controlling it and then just thrown away the points is, has been, you know, it's unacceptable, I think, actually. If you, For, if you look, how many, where, where are we giving away 1 0 leads? Brighton? Yeah. Palace? Yeah. Huddersfield? Huddersfield? Yeah. Um, West Ham, we nearly West, gave away yeah. a two, two goal lead, didn't we? You know, they're, they're, and it, it drives you mad because good teams, not great teams, but good teams, they close it out. Yeah. And, and, and do we talk about Palace? Palace, I think, had spent more time behind um, that season than any other team. I think it's something like 19 games, they'd gone behind 16 times. And they had never, they'd not come back to win. Psychologically, they should have been finished at half time mentally and physically they should have been done but we are not able to scare teams enough to to impress upon them that you know that we're going to win I, I noticed that um St Mary's was listed as one of the best away day experiences in the football supporters federation awards and i was there you know it, if fans are enjoying going to your stadium that's bad news so i mean okay it might it might mean that the pies are okay the burgers are, are good okay, pies to yeah. be fair um, sometimes they can be a little bit on the hot side, but you know, <laughs> you'd rather that than it be cold. But also, if people have voted because they've enjoyed the away day, it's normally because yeah. because they've won the match or they've enjoyed the football and felt like their team has had a, a good chance of I mean, getting you, something from it. You, you can guarantee that no one's going to uh, put that about the Emirates, yeah. You know, or or going away to Old Trafford because just people get walloped, yeah. And um, yeah, it, the the Palace game for me was the, I was, I. I'm very optimistic. Anyone who listens to this podcast will know that I generally always predict us to win and yeah. ridiculously optimistic. I'm also, I didn't believe we should go to Paul. I don't, I didn't believe we should get with Pellegrino. Palace game for me was the first time I had these, the doubts came in. I thought, yeah. is he really up to it? So is the first time you've had doubts or the first time you've thought, you know what, it may even be worth sacking the manager halfway through the season. I, I mean, who are you going to get? I, I think it, we'll, we'll come to, we might come to this, but I don't know. I think there are much bigger problems than the manager, and I think we'll come to this. But um, for, for me, the the Palace game and the horrible inevitability of it was a real low point for this yeah. season. So, I mean, what what can Pellegrino do about his in game management? Is it about motivating the players and giving them the confidence to push forward, or or is it something that Pellegrino is doing? I think back to that uh, interview that Romeo gave, where he said, "When Saints were pushing forward." They had to reflect on where are the opposition attackers. What's going to happen if suddenly there's a you know transition period and the ball changes from Saints to the opposition team, and then suddenly you're you're on the defence. 
I mean, okay, if if you're one of the centre backs or you're you know a, a right back and you can see the left back's gone bombing up, then maybe you should have some sort of response. But as you're if you're the assigned defensive midfielder or or you know one of the central midfielders and the other guy's gone up, but you know surely if you're going to be attacking and attacking effectively, you've got to have the freedom to burst out of defence. Yeah, Kuman was very very good on on the yeah. counter attack, and we would burst out of defence. And we'd run up to the other end of the pitch and we'd damage teams. I mean, even if you think of that 8 0 game against Sunderland, it wasn't necessarily us, like, it wasn't us dominating possession all the time and then picking them off one after the other. A lot of those goals actually came from counter attacks. And, and, yeah. you know, it's quite alarming to see us being so ineffectual in, in that, you know, and so sluggish coming out, out of defence. It, it's weird because we play with pace. Yeah. So, like, what is the point of giving the ball to a Redmond who's coming for a lot of stick, which I don't agree with, but what's the point of giving the ball to Redmond if you're not going to have Romeo, Lamina, Davis does, to be fair. But like, we need to swamp people. You look at like what Man City do. Yeah. You know, they get the ball, they break, and all of a sudden, not only if you're dealing with Aguero and you're dealing with Jesus, you're dealing with Fernandinho and, you know, and Silva and all these players that sit back are just flying at you. And, they overwhelm you with movement and, and pace and, and quality, to be fair. But I, I do, I just wonder, and, and there is a brilliant, and I think we'll, a lot of the things, one of the best things I read about Saints recently was the Saints report. Uh, Saint, I think St. Saint, Mary's Music. Sorry, St. Mary's Music, apologies, by Shirley Mush. If you, uh, if you definitely give it a read, it's a fantastic long analysis of Saints uh, travails this season. But it's absolutely right. Like we're stuck in two minds and, and there's a brilliant point in there where he talks about Pellegrino winning the uh, Spanish league uh, with a, in a 38 game season under Benitez where they score 51, 51 goals. 51 yeah. goals. And maybe Pellegrino thinks we can do that. But I think one of the things we've learned and we learn it against Wolves is maybe he doesn't like my mates think that Spanish league is Barcelona, Real Madrid, maybe one other team, Atletico, Atletico yeah. and then a load of farm hands. And I think maybe Spain is a bit like that. And the Premier League is not, even the pretty garbage teams have yeah. players that on their day can really hurt you. And I, I just think maybe we've found that out probably a bit too late this season. And, uh, I think as well, looking at the Premier League, this is also where commitments and the team spirit can get you a little bit further because the Premier League, say, has five or six big clubs or five or six kind of clubs where the players will think, oh, that's a club I'd love to play for. Okay, like an aspirational club. Yeah, it? yeah. exactly. So you know, that's your Man United, your Chelsea's, your Arsenal's, Man City, obviously. Um, and then you kind of have like this next kind of load of clubs, which some of them are decent, some of them, okay, people would be really excited about playing for, but a lot of them will have foreign players who will hope to be using. So who would be in that list of your clubs? So for you? Southampton, West Ham, Leicester, Everton, Leicester. You know, these are clubs where a player might come in from abroad and think, well, if I do really well at one of these clubs, I'm going to get my chance to move on to, to one of the big ones. Just well, arguably, you, look at Southampton. We've done that. Yeah. You know, if you if you want a stepping stone, yeah. we're the best it, stepping it, stone you can get. Exactly, time and time again. And then there's a lot of clubs as well, like that, in, in this band, where they have players that have come in and they've not quite ever reached that level. And they kind of almost realise it's not. But they're, they're a good player. They do well, but they're kind of going through the motions. And if you can be more committed than the players that are going through the motions, then you can beat those clubs. At the moment, Saints have a lot of players that look like they're going through the motions. Tadic is probably your prime example. And Redmond's um, lost his way, but I think that's for bigger, for, that's bigger things than Yeah, I, don't, I think Redmond's maybe going through a pretty serious patch of um, Quite, no you know, confidence, depression and com lack of confidence yeah. at the moment. Um, but we can get on to, on to Redmond. But yeah, if you have a committed group of players pushing forward, there's always going to be someone lacklustre not tracking back. And that's where you get absolutely punished. And, and you know, perhaps it's the, the games where we're playing against the big sides that our players are playing with a bit more commitment, doing themselves justice, you know, maybe in the shop window to go to one of the big clubs. And then it's against these medium-sized clubs, the, the Palaces, um, you know, the Watfords, the West Broms, the Leicester Cities, where it's not really a big deal outside of either of those two clubs and we're not yeah. seeing that level of commitment. I, I don't know this idea of, uh, you hear this a lot and um, people say, oh, you know, players put themselves in the shop windows of the game against big clubs. I hope that bit of football being the multi-billion pound business it is that they do so much uh, 
you know, work on who to sign, and who not to sign, that they look at it very much holistically, both on and off the pitch. I, I think that um, we, I, I wonder if they and I, you know, not want to get on the back of the, the foreign players, but we signed a lot of players, possibly at the expense of very good youth players. Some of those players are definitely an improvement. So a lot of Saints fans really like Jason McCarthy. You can't argue that Cedric Suarez is a better player. Um, but, you know, we sign, um, you know, we've signed players that have meant other players haven't been given a chance. So like my personal fan favourite, Josh Sims. Yeah. Yeah, he came back in, he was on the bench uh, on Saturday, which was great to see. I mean, um, he has had a long He's had a long term injury, yeah, but, so. you know, uh, but the one that really stands out for me and we, you know, John I mentioned earlier tonight is Harrison Reed. He's yeah. playing all the way up pretty well, by all accounts, at, uh, at Norwich. We signed, we had Harrison Reed. We had a short, spiky attacking, uh, sorry, defensive midfield player who could win the ball back and pass it around, who seemed to be really good. And then we signed Jordi Classy, yeah. um, who I don't think it was really much, any great shakes. And I, I just wonder if we're going to, call, wonder if we've got too many mercenaries and, yeah. we, and we could do with a few more players that really care. Yeah, a, a bit more committed and, yeah. you know, perhaps have been schooled you know come through and, and you know they have been looking forward to playing the Southampton first team all their lives yeah I, I think you could well be into on something there right should we move on to um are, are we done with analyzing our loss against Palace I mean it was pretty miserable it was a low um and actually you know you mentioned that you thought at this point this is when you start thinking do should we be sacking Pellegrino um I'm going to come to this later as well, but we've had the big interview in the Daily Echo. From yeah. Where, should, we, should we talk about this now? Because it, the timing of it was I can't hours before the Palace game. I have to talk because uh, I have to talk about it through a prism of two things. One, obviously, I'm a Saints fan. Two, my job is t- I, I do like corporate PR. So like, I would have been the person at Southampton that sets that interview up and provides the rationale and goes to Ralph Kruger and says we should do this or if Ralph Kruger says I think we should do it you then kind of talk it through so that's kind of my my yeah. job I've no idea why they did that interview like you should only talk when you have news otherwise the conversation meanders and you can talk about anything we had no news we had no signings the season is going by anyone's reckoning terribly and why do it on the eve of the Palace game because what it means is if, if we go out that night and we lose 6-0 to Palace it means you still can't fire the manager because you've come out that very day and said he's the right guy. He understands the Southampton way. He's committed. I just have no idea what they were hoping to gain. Well, I mean, what I have noticed on Twitter, certainly um, a little bit in the, the forums as well on the World Wide Web, is that Saints fans have been complaining that we're not hearing from the club. You know, we've got a new owner. We haven't heard from him yet. And, you know, perhaps his English isn't great. So, you know, Ralph Kruger has to be the spokesperson for that. But it does seem odd, doesn't it? it? I mean, surely he must have had a plan when he invested £200 million into the club. That is the point, isn't it? When you come in and you say, I'll introduce myself. This is my family background. It's my strategy. It's my long-term um, thing. You know, th- these are the things that I'm thinking about, but obviously I'm going to work with Ralph and Les and blah, 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 and we'll work it all out in the future. And then you can kind of come and revisit that. And I think Ralph Kruger was just reacting to the noise on social media, which is also rather worrying because it tells you that the club are paying attention well, <laughs> to what they see on social media. Well, we know the club does that yeah. because they sacked Claude Well, yeah. uh, which I've no doubt was a reaction to a very vocal minority, both at St. Mary's. And I mean, on social media. People do tell me that he was not very popular amongst the players and not very popular within the club, you know, as, as a person. But the weird thing was, I the, the company I work for is very data focused and they're very um, kind of quite clinical about how they do things. And they look at a lot of data and they look at, do a lot of analysis before they do anything. In that interview, Kruger says, we act on a feeling. Yeah. And like... And also, also, that's not the Southampton way that we've been told about. I, yeah, we've been told about black this box. black box. What's the black box got in it? You know, your yeah, feelings. Your feel, and like, what, you're acting on a feeling. Like, yeah. you, you, there, like, there is no feeling, right? The empirical evidence was they finished eighth. They got to a cup final. There is no feeling. Yeah. And I just thought it was that, like, if you're, if you're me, right, and you're briefing Kruger for the interview and he says, well, why did I fire? Well... Like, 
either you hang the guy out to dry mm. and say, yeah, it wasn't popular. You know, there was a mutiny amongst the players, da 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 da. Or you say, we, we, we fired we fired well because we knew we could get Pellegrino and Pellegrino is amongst the next generation of the best coaches in Europe. He doesn't say either. He just says, yeah, feeling. Yeah. You know, like, why are we running a, what is it worth? 200 million pound business? A massive business that would probably be, you know, it could be a FTSE 250 business. Why are we running it as a feeling? Like, it doesn't make sense. Isn't football all about feelings, though, Tom? It's, isn't it all about the passion? Yeah, it is, it is of, for of, us. Yeah, but like you're not paying. You're not paying me. I don't know how much Kruger and Les Reed are paid. Mm. There will be the you know the two highest paid directors probably at the club. I guarantee that they're on at least. Do you think they're on more than the grand. players? Oh God, no, 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 no. But I, I, you know, I bet Kruger's probably. If you think if you're running a, a two hundred million pound business, you're probably on at least two hundred fifty grand a year. So. But what, but what my, my point is this, right? If you're running, and it is a business, and we can say it's not as much as we like, but it is, why are you running it on a feeling? And if you've got people there that run it on a feeling, then that's a bit alarming to me. So, I mean, that, that was the thing which was most alarming to you. The thing that really wound me up was that he called Southampton a small club. What, like How many three, times? four, five times throughout the interview? It was a good handful. Um, and... You know, you, you wonder about this. So Ralph Kruger and Les Reed and Katrina Lieber have obviously been in contact with the Gale family. And, you know, they've sold the club to the Gale family. So the club gets £130 million from television money. I don't know how many extra million it gets from TV, uh, from, you know, the extra bonus games, TV revenue, the prize money in the Premier League, the, ground. the gate receipts. Yep. Um, what they're taking on the match day and the bars sales of players and, and the, the bookies and yeah, player sales and all of this, you know, we're talking, yeah, you're probably over a 200 million pound, uh, income and you're calling the club small. There's 32,000 people that show up. We take 5,000 people to a, an away game when the club are playing uh, appallingly. I don't know by what comparison you're saying we're a small club. Yeah. We might be a small club in comparison you know, financially to Manchester City, Manchester United, Liverpool and Chelsea. But then if you look at but, a lot but, of the big Italian clubs, they yeah. probably, like, look at Lazio, they probably are as well, but they're not yeah. a small club. No, no, no. Like Roma. But we, you know, compare us to the rest of Europe and we're probably in the top 25 clubs. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, to my... That's, to, a, that, that's a big club, isn't it? Again, to my point, like, what was the point of the interview? Yeah. Like, what was he hoping that he would get out of it? Like, what was his end result? was his end result that people go, yeah, that was the right decision. But really like words are important. Words mean a lot. And football fans read more into every single word. Like they read into a Jose Fonte Instagram comment. They work, they read into every single word. And if you call your club small three or four times, then that's, that's like a, that's like a, that's like a bell. It's like a ding, ding, ding. That's a warning. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, we know that the point was, wasn't it? Was to lower expectations. So last season we finished eighth. Season before we finished sixth. Season before that we finished seventh. Season before that we finished eighth. So the last four seasons we've been amazing. It, it, you know, it, it have been fantastic seasons to be a Saints fan. Even the season before that we'd excited, it, it signed a really exciting manager and uh, Pochettino. We'd started to play some really, really exciting, With great English football. talent. Yeah. Um, so it has been a fantastic five years in terms of being a Saints fan. We've never had five seasons in a row where we've been consistently good banging on the door of Europe we've had a cup final we've had players that have come on leaps and bounds that have gone on to become internationals and global superstars um, and whatnot and then you know there's there's this small club stuff I think like you know what it's, it's just it, it, you can tell it's wound me up you know and you're the, a very calm man John yeah Anyway, you're not a man to get wound up. And then, and then, so like in the big interview part two in the Daily Echo, um, it's a little bit less kind of inflammatory, but he talks about um, Mr. Gal's plans I, um, uh, for, for the club. And we talk about stadium improvements. So you think, oh, yeah, no, okay, I, I can see that. Games against Man United, we could definitely sell like 40,000 seats. I, I'm sure we could. You know, there's, there's an interest. The fact that we're filling the stadium when we're playing such turgid football and predictable football that's really disappointing. You think, yeah, okay, it's loyalty. Maybe, maybe it is time to throw an extra five, six, 
thousand. And, on, and as on, I understand the it, the stadium they just bolt on another stand, and there's yeah. one of these modern things like an IKEA so, thing. And, and um, Gao's uh, business in China does develop sports complex and stadiums. So you think, okay, brilliant. But actually, no, in this interview, he then talks about, no, we're not going to imp- Im- improve the capacity. We're talking about the stadium experience. Some of the land around- It's a lick of paint. Yeah, so, yeah, what is it? A lick of paint, some slightly different food offerings, you know, maybe like a slightly hipster coffee bar in there as well. I would love or a flat some- wire at St. Mary's. Yeah, um- or maybe some craft beer. That, you know, <laughs> but, I mean, come on, the... the- the thing, the match day experience at St. Mary's, the thing that is letting it down is not the bloody well, pies the, or the pints, is it? It's what's the, happening on the pitch. The match day experience, the, the clue about what is the match day experience is, is in the word match day. You know, it's the bloody match. And I don't care, right? I, I'll go to St. Mary's. I don't care if I have to stand up. I don't care if I have to not be able to get a pint at half time. The pies have got rats in. I don't care. I care about the football and I care about winning. Or yeah. if I don't, if they're not winning, at least turning up and showing that they care. And I, I wonder if this is a this is a, this is the Sky Legacy, isn't it? This is that football is not a, an entertainment uh, for you and me. This is a it's a global product. Yeah. Um, that is a product in the same way you go to like the O2 and you watch Michael McIntyre, and it's about the experience and it's about you know selling the TV rights to India and China and, and whoever and it. It worries me that there's this um, disconnect Mm. between what football fans actually want and what maybe Mr. Gow and Mr. Kruger and Mr. Reid think they want. Yeah. And it's probably the the type of football fans that they speak to will be the ones that are paying, you know, the extra bit of money to be in the box or being in the director's box, you know, stuff like that. They're not meeting the, you know, me and you and... You know, my brother, your dad, the the people that we know that yeah. go to the Saints matches, and uh, and it's funny, uh, you know, just on the whole general feeling of football. I mean, did you ever go to the Dell and think, oh, you know what, like I really enjoyed Matt Letizia's hat trick today, and you know, um, but if only that pie had been a bit warmer, or yeah. you know, I would have preferred a branded pie rather yeah. than a regular pie. I know. You look at Sky, like they've become entertainers, haven't they? And you look at like Pogba's haircut and all that. It's it is about them being entertainers, but I, I worry that they've, there's but just the, a disconnect. The the, the the football brand there though is just as much for the millions and millions of people around the world that maybe get to come to St Mary's once in a lifetime. You know when they come and visit uh, England on a, on a big holiday, and you know they'll, they'll come. N- not necessarily for the rest of us, but anyway. You know, we're going down a very, very well trodden path of yeah. being like back in my day when football was really football and chicken really tasted the, like chicken. Yeah, and the ball weighed a ton. Yeah. Um so let let's let's draw a line under that. We've had a, we've had a good old whinge. Um we won a game on Saturday, so we scored a goal. Yeah, and we went to a fantastic <laughs> old football ground, didn't we? Yeah. With, you know, they don't I, care I mean, about the match they experience, do they? I, I didn't try any of their pies or you know, but it was pretty busy in there. Five thousand, four and a half thousand, five thousand uh Saints fans uh behind the goal. Um I love I love the third round of the FA Cup. It's one of my favourite match days. So you generally walk out the house. It'll be a really crisp winter morning. You know, it's cold. The skies tend you're to be You're going clear. somewhere different. If it's an away game, you might be going somewhere new and exciting that you've yeah. not been to before. If you're doing well in the league, then you think, well, you know, we're doing well in the league, but maybe we could win the cup. If you're doing badly in the league like we are, you think, well, thank God this isn't a Premier League game. You know, we've got a chance to actually enjoy a match with no consequences. You and, know. and either we'll win the cup or the run will give us the confidence to do better in the league. Yeah. Um, but I, I do. I absolutely love the FA Cup third round. You know, well, when I was growing up, I didn't just watch Southampton. I grew up in the West Country in Bath. Uh, Bristol Rovers used to play there. Bath City uh, played in Bath as well. So I used to sometimes watch, I mean, you know, the chance of a smaller club coming against a big club. It, it is romantic. It is fun. Um, it's a great equaliser, isn't it? Yeah. And I, there's nothing that I've enjoyed more, um, you know, as a Saints fan than the cup runs that we've had over the year. You know, I really enjoyed last season's um, trip to Wembley and you know, the semi-finals against Liverpool were great. The match against Arsenal at the Emirates was was fantastic. Really thoroughly enjoyed that cup run. The FA Cup in 2003, oh, the semi-final the against final, yeah. Watford was one of the greatest days of my life. 
the finals was really exciting to go to the four 0 win against Spurs, you know, in yeah. the, in the third round, you know, that was another third round day. Um, so I love the FA cup. I love the cup runs. I even love the Johnson's paint trophy when, when we're down in league one and winning that, that was great. And you know, it didn't disappoint. You know, the, the trip was great. The pub before the match was great. The atmosphere was top. I mean, yeah, it was a really good for, day for, out. For 80 minutes, the atmosphere was top from the Saints yeah, fans, wasn't it? I think it, it was. And I think we saw kind of the best and worst of Saints fans, didn't yeah. we? And um, we're all guilty of it. But it was a really good day out. You're right, the FA Cup is magical. Um, the best bit of football for me this weekend was uh, was not Southampton. If you, if you watch Match of the Day again, mm. watch the Coventry versus Stoke. And watch Stoke have four or five shots from inside the box uh, when they're losing with like four minutes to go. And every single time a Coventry player just leaps in the way and gets in the way of it. It's the best bit of like Ole football, yeah. but not because they're playing well, just because they put their bodies on the line. It's brilliant. But no, it was a great day. Um, a good result. And I think Saints played really quite well, I think, you know, against a good team. Yeah. I mean, immediately after the match, I felt like, yeah, we've won, but it's been quite unconvin- unconvincing. And I think as a whole, the way that we played was a little bit unconvincing. But when you watch the highlights reel on Match of the Day on the BBC website, you can see that we, we created a lot of very good chances. Yeah. And Fulham didn't create many. No. And, and so despite the fact that some of the play may have been a little bit frustrating, a little bit stifled, at the end of the day... We had five or six really good chances. Fulham had hit the one. bar at the goal. Yeah. Side. It was a really professional job for Saints. Like, yeah. you know, until you've been to Craven Cottage, I don't think you can contemplate how small that pitch is. It seems tiny by Premier League standards. Um, and also, Fulham are a very good team. They snapped into every single tackle uh, from the get go. They played a really high pressing game, which surprisingly enough, they had the fitness, I think, to carry on through yeah. the entire game and then to take the game to Saints. Um, and and they weren't they're not a bad team they've got the highest possession in any uh of any championship club they they won their last game 4-1 they're no mugs um but no Saints did a really professional job and I I think in the old days yeah Premier League teams would wallop championship teams but yeah. maybe the golf isn't there anymore yeah I mean I kind of joked with you that I, I think we found our level you know mid-table championship and, and we would have quite you know if that's what we'd expect a great then, run. then we'd have a really good season um Joking aside, though, Shane Long's goal wasn't far offside, was it? And it was a really great take from him. So and a brilliant touch from Davis, yeah. showing the value, the, the value of Stephen Davis, yeah. that intelligence that he has. I, I had a few fans in the stands and um, saw a couple of comments on social media saying that Davis didn't have a great game against him. To me, I thought he looked really good, and I think he does look good. You know, as you're saying, in that tighter pitch where it is close football. Yeah, he, he's, he's got great skills and great brain. Yeah. He's almost, you feel a bit sorry for him because if he was a Brazilian and he was playing, you know, for like, you if know. If he wasn't called Stephen Davis. If he was called like Davisinho, uh, <laughs> you know, like everyone would look at those touches and the back heels and the close control and the opening up of play and go, ooh, ah. But because he's kind of just a really good, honest pro, but which we obviously, we love Stephen yeah. Davis. Um, other players uh, as well as um, Stephen Davis that I thought to were, Pierre Emil Hoiberg. I'm, Guy's I'm, an animal. I'm becoming a really, really big fan of this man. You almost wonder, like, where, like, the, what this season, what, how could this season have been if Charlie Austin had played a more prominent role at the beginning yeah. and and Peh had played a more prominent role? Because he's a monster. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he has got like a bit of a mouthful of a name. What are we? Are we going to call him Peh? Pe. Doesn't it sounds really work. a bit like a something you have to go to I, I get this, a cream for. Yeah, comments in the YouTube comment section. What should we call Pierre Emil Hoiberg so that we don't have to kind of go through that mouthful? Thought he had a really strong performance. Thought Buffon as well. Shade. Um, yeah. You know, he, he had some really good touches. I liked his audacity of shooting from you know <laughs> almost on the byline after doing some sort of insane outside Cruyff turn yeah. on the byline and being the player. The, the guy is clearly talented and I think, you know, he's one really good manager away from kind of going from that, that, ta- that raw talented player to becoming someone really special. And, but it's a manager who's not only good with kind of teaching him what he needs to do with his talent, but also, you know, getting him to work on his, his attitude and his commitment as well. Yeah. Because when he does show commitment and attitude um, that is positive for Saints, he, he looks really, really good. Yeah, he... 
he seems to have, I don't know, he's kind of going through this best of worst, best and worst of Buffal like compilation, but at the same time where sometimes he's brilliant. Sometimes he throws himself on the floor. I think against Palace, you saw a lot of that. Um, but yeah, like he, he clearly has more talent than anyone else. Yeah. Probably for Saints, he clearly is the one player that we've got that can do something completely off the charts. Um, so he has to play. Um, but again, Saints, we're lacking the cutting edge. Um, so obviously Shane Long's goal is offside. Uh, Stevens hit the crossbar from about four yards out, which, yeah, I mean, he, he really should It was interesting that. watching the aftermath of that because he did it and you, Romeo came straight up to him and gave him like a sort of, it's going to be all right yeah. type thing. And then Shane Long had to go over and be like, it's going to be fine. Yeah. Like, I, I've missed more shots than anyone. Don't worry about it, mate. It's yeah. going to be totally fine. And probably Redmond could have come on and said, I've, lo- I've missed loads. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah well, mind you, he'd probably look at Redmond <laughs> and think, oh God. Yeah, Redmond would probably miss him. He'd like, do that behind his head. Yeah, I don't know. It, it was really unlucky, Stevens. Yeah. And it, he had a really good game yeah, again. He, he did. James Will Prowse, he got himself into some useful positions. But again, I mean, it was, it was good left foot to finish. He put his foot through it, gave it a little bit of pace, which actually got through the keeper, um, which I thought was great. Gabbiadini with a, a shocking miss. Uh, I mean, I mean, he, I think it was probably Rose harder. Out. Yeah, I we, mean, we were in road W. Oh yeah, and he it went well and, over us. You know, there was it was a good ten or so rows behind us where that shot ended up. I mean, I've been playing a lot of FIFA, and he shot like I shot on FIFA, which is just high and wide. Uh, but like I don't know it was probably a harder chance but then you wonder if the Gabudini of last season would have just dinked it or done something I don't know or uh, yeah, well, you know I mean whether he would have just buried it but also I mean the other thing as well I think when you have players that are lacking confidence particularly strikers they're looking to get that goal they try harder yeah and and the best thing that he could have done in that, in that thing was just pass it to David pass it to Davis Davis who you know like because the defender had committed himself if he'd have seen maybe he didn't see him but just a little knock to Davis um, and then Davis could have missed rather yeah. than Gabbiadini missing so I mean I, I wonder immediately after the match I thought it was unconvincing um, again you know it, it seems a bit odd the in-game management from from Pellegrino I mean Shane Long has been running a hell of a lot over this holiday season, um, you know, over Christmas and New Year uh, with Charlie Austin out. He's been running, 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 working really hard. And from about 60 minutes... Well, he did he, one lung-busting run, didn't he? Yeah. That almost like, it, uh, like a boxer that almost like took him out. Yeah, I don't, I've not seen Shane Long not chase up. I mean, there was a speculative long ball, which would have made, maybe, you know, been 50-50 for Shane Long. You know, it would have been a complete no hope chance for most strikers, but for Shane Long, you'd normally see him chase it. And just see, when you're seeing Shane Long not chasing stuff, you know yeah. he, he's in trouble. And he signaled to the bench to come off and it still took, what, like another 50 It was weird. Minutes. Well, it was weird because I don't know if there's something, and this, uh, you know, I hate keep going back to the Palace game, but there is, there are common ground here. And the Palace game, we had... What I thought, I thought at one point Palace game we were ready to make substitutions, and then we didn't. Uh, the sort of substitutions like the Lamina substitution, yeah. and I, and it, and then we kind of didn't. And Redmond was coming on for long. I think was it Redmond that came on for long? No, Gavidini came on for. Yeah, Gavidini came on for. But long. It, it seemed to take about like all joking aside, like it seemed to take about three or four minutes for the substitution to be made for the player to get his coat mm. off and stuff. And I don't know, like, why does it take so long? Yeah, it, I don't know. It, it did seem very, very, very strange. You know, um, I'm sure Gabbiadini wouldn't have minded coming on for an extra 15 minutes or so. But then again, you know, Gabbiadini, when he came on, he didn't like run around with the energy of someone who, well, I've got to try. You know, but I, that's I, not what he does. No, you know, that's what Shane Long does. Like Gabbiadini is a, you know, we love Gabbiadini because he's that cultured kind of yeah. bit lazy. <laughs> Almost like a bit like Matt Latiss. It's like, just give me the ball in a position where I can hurt people. Um, and, Shane and we Long, did that, and he put it And we did that, and he put it over. But which, by the way, he won that ball yeah. on the halfway line. But um, yeah, they play a different style, but maybe the tactics were, you know, we know that Fulham are going to are gonna really push yeah. on now, and we need someone who can hurt them on the break. And Shane, even a 80, 70% fit Shane Long is still probably faster and more aggressive than a fully fit Gabby Dini. Yeah. Um, 
Redmond came on, we said we'd talk about Redmond, and he didn't play well at all. He gave the ball away. He, there, there was one chance where I think he did quite well, actually, the Gabbiadini chance that we're talking, where we yeah, broke did away well. quickly. And it was a great first touch. Yeah, great first touch. Played it in front of him. He created the chance. Um, uh, I think he knocked it on to Lamina, didn't he? He back it very smartly. It to, to Gabbiadini. Um, but probably, you know, in his involvement, I don't know how long he was on the pitch for, like 20 minutes or so, something like that. Probably had like, you know, somewhere between like six to 10 times on the ball. And most of it didn't come off. And I think the most disappointing thing for me really was the way um, the Saints fans reacted to Revan and say, I know it's really, really difficult to kind of have sympathy for a multi-millionaire yeah like good looking young multi-millionaire paid, yeah probably more than most of us do in a year and if you follow him every on, week on uh on instagram his girlfriend is quite something you love commenting on the looks of these people they're so, just yeah. so attractive these I mean, people one day we're, i think we're gonna have to do a, a top 10 tom's wags from instagram you know? it's a, maybe something you can work on something. we'll get a list out there sign for christmas maybe um but the guy clearly He's, he's lacking confidence um, and he's not going to get any more confident with us booing him. Yeah, I think I think football fans need to get away from two kind of weird beliefs that they have. Uh, one is that players are always fit and can play games constantly and can never be tired and never be fatigued because uh, they're fresh athletes. So the idea that they could ever be fatigued is wrong. Um, and the idea that mentally... They're not affected. And I, I, I think one of the things that I've always noticed about, about um, Redmond is, is on the pitch, he's much more expressive than a lot of other footballers. Yeah. You know, you'll see like when he's playing with Bertrand, if Bertrand doesn't do something right, like, and I'll, we'll do this because you can watch us on YouTube, but you'll see Redmond and he'll be like... Yeah, arms... Arms, arms like arms flailing, flailing around, yeah. like shouting and like being yeah. quite uh, demonstrative. And you don't see a lot of the footballers do that. They're actually quite normally quite placid and they might throw their hands in the air, but Redmond almost loses it. And I don't know what Saints fans are hoping to get out of Nathan Redmond um, by barracking him. He's not going anywhere. Um, he is going to play or be on the bench because he is one of our better footballers, mm. believe it or not. And I think we need to really take a long, hard look at ourselves because what do we hope? Like, what, like if you, like the, the, he was noticeably booed yeah. on, on Saturday and you want to like get those fans and say like, right, think about it. Like, what do you think is going to happen? Your booings. Do you think that like Redmond is going to sort of go, Oh, you know what? Actually I've not been playing well. I didn't realize until now I'll, I'll start playing well. Yeah. Or do you think he's going to go, I want out of there. I don't want on that pitch. And, you saw like when he walked off, he could not like he wanted off that pitch. Yeah. I mean him and Gabby Adina were the first down the tunnel, weren't yeah. they? Yeah. I don't know. It was but Gabby Adina had great support yeah. even from way before he came on. But I, I felt sorry for Redmond. I, yeah. I think Saints fans need to like they need to realise that we're in big khaki doo doo. Yeah. And we're not gonna get out of khaki doo doo unless we really support get, that get group of players. players. I mean when you speak to some of the ex-players as we've been lucky enough to do so um the ones that were particularly like playing in the dow during our kind of relegation battle after relegation battle after relegation battle used to talk about the real importance of the fans getting behind the team um at the dow i imagine it's even more noticeable than than it is at st mary's but still i mean the atmosphere at st mary's is not good no it's pretty poisonous a lot of the time if you compare it to the atmosphere at craven cottage on saturday that was great. You know, that was like people were standing up and we sang pretty much. There's a little bit of a quiet bit about halfway through the first half after we scored the goal. Fulham fans weren't giving anything back. Obviously, they never, ever do. So quiet. But, you know, the second half, we just got on with it, sang the whole way through until about 80 minutes. We were frustrated that we hadn't got the second goal. Um, I think people wanted to show their frustration with Pellegrino, the manager. So and they wanted an opportunity yeah. to do that, didn't they? Because they can't do that any like when we're winning. Like you can't just shout to sack the manager. So you do it when... When he makes a substitution, which yeah. where he pulls off one of the brilliant players. Yeah. And I think that I almost felt... I, I, I don't understand. Like this, again, the mentality of the fans and the fans pay their money and and you know most of them, many of them go to more games than I do and they pay... And I respect that. And of course, everyone is entitled to their opinions. But we also have to recognise that 81 minutes into a game, Hoiberg has covered every single blade of grass... Lamina is a similar 
ball winning midfield player who can break up the ball and move it forward fast and recycle the play. Like it was a it was a sensible substitution. It seemed to me to be a sensible substitution. It was it, it was it was more the fact that people were upset that Hoyberg was being pulled off. You know, and less I think about who was actually coming on. Because I think, you know, the Saints fans do like Lamina and they sang the Mario Lamina song after um after the substitution was beat. Anyway, I, I think we should move on. Um Definitely let us know what, what your thoughts are. Um, I personally don't boo the, the players, but I am guilty of, you know, if Redmond gives the ball away, I'm just like, oh, Redmond, you... But that's, a, that's but, a natural reaction. I think it's more of a natural yeah, reaction. a moment of an outburst like, of But you can't boo like Redmond when he, like, when he comes on. Yeah, you've, you've you can't boo him. him. Right, anyway, let's move on. So we're into the next round. We've got Watford... Going to win the cup. ...at home, um, who we beat... In the semi-final of the FA Cup, when we got to the to the final back in two thousand and three, this is, isn't I there mean, a lot of like similarities between this season and other seasons. Well, to be honest, when we got to the the cup final in two thousand and three, in the FA Cup, we finished eighth in the division. We we're doing yeah. well, so it has more similarity to last season when we actually achieved a cup final. Yeah, I mean, but you know, hopefully, hopefully just get that winning mentality. I mean, what, we've only won five games this season, including that. So yeah. a couple of wins in the FA Cup is is, is well needed. Um, one thing we've not talked about, and you know, I don't want to spend too much time speaking about him, Virgil van Dijk, he's gone. Thanks for the money. Yeah. I think it's a crazy decision from Saints. If they knew he wanted to go in the summer, if, if and also we go back to Kruger's interview, we won't talk about it too much, but mm. again, Kruger's interview, there was a shadow over the club mm. for the first half of the season. Well, a why they let why is if he's such a shadow stick him training with the schoolboys? Yeah, can, can I call bollocks on that? Yeah, like stick him training with the schoolboys, yeah. pay him his money. Yeah, he doesn't go anywhere near the first team, but like don't not sell him for what seems to be 15 million quid or 10 million quid benefit, mm. which in the world of Premier League football, crazy enough, is peanuts. Yeah, and then moan that he's ruined half your season. I mean, they they were just like, Krieger was just looking for a scapegoat there. Um, I I'm not sad to see Virgil go, and I think that tells you an awful lot because if you'd spoken to me this time last season about Virgil Van Dijk and asked me about it, I would have said he's one of the best central defenders I've ever seen in the Premier League. Like he he's, he for, he still is for me yeah. like comfortably the best central I've ever seen play for Saints. He, he, Seriously, seriously talented individual. The way he played against Inter Milan when we beat them at St. Mary's was, showed leadership quality. But we know that. And the the problem is, is he has not done it for Saints since he got injured. He had that long recovery and he's repaid it by behaving a bit like a petulant child. Yeah. And, and he, you know, he's let us, if not a shadow over the club... Definitely been sticking well, out the dressing room. According right, to Kruger, he left the shadow. And I yeah. think there's a couple of things. I think, A, the club played it really badly by getting rid of him now. I should have got rid of him in the summer. I should have invested and yeah. planned for the future. And I think the second thing is, I think in the long term, I think he sold himself short. Yeah, I, I really do. I, don't, I can see what the club were doing. They're probably looking at him and thinking, well, you know, he's a professional. He's getting paid well. He's a good football player. He's going to do what Schneiderlin did. He's going to do what Wanyama did. Give us another good season. He clearly wasn't willing to do that. But he'd obviously he'd been given the nod only by Liverpool, and the clubs all tap up other players. And Saints are probably as guilty as any. He's been given the nod by Liverpool. Look, you're coming. Don't overexert yourself. Don't do anything that's going to bust your knee or pull your hamstring or bust your foot again. Just get through to January, and you'll come. And that's yeah. what he did. We'll pay whatever it takes. Um, so what we're we going to do with the Virgil Van Dijk money? Sessegnon, he is one of the players that we've been rumoured to be scouting. He was at Fulham. What did you make of him? He looked all right. We've also got three very good left backs, haven't we? Yeah. Like, I mean, and we've got Jan Valer. I think is Jan Valer who can play left back. He's uh, very. Ben Eric, well, he, he played right back. Well, ben Eric played right back, but, but Jan Valer in the in the youth team, I think, can play Jan left Valerie. back. Okay. Yeah, who's a you're going to realms that football I'm hipster mind. town here, okay. but uh, but I I don't. Assessing on is undoubtedly a, a, a good talent, and to yeah. play a lot, to play sixty odd games at the age of seventeen, you must be. But we've already got Bertrand, who is England's best left back. Sam McQueen is also very, very good, and Target is a good, very good, is a good player. Old fashioned target, old fashioned tar- target, yeah. yeah. Um, Looks old fashioned as well. Yeah. Say, so, I mean, R. Kelly one for one, Russell Kelly. 
um, if you want to follow him on Twitter, RKA141, he asks, you know, what positions do we need to sign? So let's say from the 75 million quid, you've been given 50 million by the board. That's very nice. Um, who are you going to spend it on, Tom? Um, that's a great question. I don't. The problem you have is that anyone who's any good is not available. Yeah. And anyone, that, and anyone that is available is going to cost twice what they should. A, because it's January, and B, because people know that Saints are flush with cash. Um, Walcott's probably been the strongest rumour. Yeah, I, I I would take Walcott back. I, I, I would. I think he, if you think like if we replace Redmond with Walcott, is that an upgrade? Yes. Mm. Would Redmond maybe benefit from having someone like Walcott he could learn from? And, you, you know, like Walcott is a very streaky player as well. I think Walcott would be a good signing. The the crazy thing is, right, is I don't actually think we need... I think we probably need a new centre-forward, like mm. a real goal scorer, but they're few and far between. What about this Sam Gallagher lad who's been banging them in the for big guy. City? Yeah. Well, Birmingham City... Well, I, don't know. I mean, I don't think we should get too excited. Birmingham <laughs> City are bottom of the championship, and I think Sam Gallagher scored four or five yeah. goals, admittedly, in a terrible team. Um, I, I don't think it's about signing players. Yeah. I, I, I've said it before. Like Our squad is great. A goalkeeper? Yeah, maybe. But yeah. I, even then, like, Forster is a good goalkeeper. His yeah. confidence is gone. McCarthy's a good goalkeeper. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's more... I don't know. Maybe I'm just really unimaginable. Like, so I just you, can't think of players... You're saying we spend 50 million quid on the new manager's contract to come in and shake things up and his new coaching I, team that's going to rejuvenate Fraser Forster, turn Nathan Redmond into the Thierry Henry that Claude Puel thought he could be. Thought he could be. My prediction is um, that by the end of the transfer window, Saints will have spent barely anything of that money if you want my honest view okay and i think they will say that the quality that they need to improve the squad because that's what they have to yeah. do they can't buy players that are the same as they've already got they have to buy players that are going to improve the squad is simply not available in a january transfer window at a price which is in any way representative of what the players were so I, I i think i won't be surprised if we walk away with like a walcott loan signing mm. and someone like Stuart armstrong from celtic for 10 is it Stuart armstrong or i think the the guy we've perennially linked with from celtic for 10 million quid and i you know i don't think we'll see any more movement yeah. okay um i haven't got any particular bright ideas i mean one of the issues well, who that would I you say? Is that i mean i don't really watch anyone other than southampton so my knowledge of other players is limited purely to players um that we play against and you know you're right in the fact that the the decent players probably wouldn't necessarily want to come to southampton right, I, right now i think the one that maybe you could see happening um but perhaps isn't because you'd thought he'd been part of the Van Dyke deal is maybe um, oh, Twat Dancer who plays for Liverpool does the thing. <laughs> oh, you got me, you know. Daniel Sturridge. Daniel Sturridge. My memory's terrible. But, you know, because you, you could see him. But again, like his wages, he's probably on like 110 yeah, grand a I week get, and he gets injured. And I mean, that doesn't seem like a very saint signing to me. No, but then getting relegated does strange things. You know, the, the threat of getting relegated yeah. would do a strange thing to a club. Um, yeah, say so, I mean, I, I would take Walcott. I think the figure that I've seen being banded around is £30 million. I don't think he's worth but that. he's out of contract in the summer. So, like, if that's true for a 30-year-old player who has no resale value yeah. and is out of contract in f five months and gets injured constantly yeah. and has not played this season... Saints should walk away. From, yeah, that is toxic, that transfer. Well, I mean, what, what would be the upper level that you go to there? 15, 20? Yeah, 10, 15. Like, oh, yeah. You have to be realistic. Like, he's not the player he was. He gets injured. He's streaky. He can't get in a not particularly good Arsenal team. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think we'd... I think if Saints pay £30 million for him, then we've been really tucked up. Um, Russell Kenny also asks who's to blame players, managers, directors, chairman, owners or fans' expectations. I think we've pretty much talked about all, all of those, but probably apart from necessarily the fans' expectations. I don't think the fans are to blame. No. I don't. I, th I think the fans pay their money. Fans earn a lot less money than the players do and they're entitled. If they feel the players aren't giving 100%, yeah. then they're entitled to, to, to voice their opinions. I mean, I also think that after four seasons where you've consistently hit the the targets in terms of what you want to achieve, then you know you 
you should be looking to maintain that level anyway. So, you know, the fans' expectations that we finish, what, top eight? I, th- I think I think that is the fans' expectations. So, John, what was it you told me at the weekend about season ticket prices? Yeah, I was, um, we got the fifth or sixth yeah. highest season ticket prices in the league. So, why should... like? What you know? You know and, and, and we're a club outside not? of London as well. Yeah. I mean, you, and Southampton you, is not. Uh, it's probably one of the wealthier New Forest, Hampshire, yeah. probably one. But the city centre is not. You know, it's not one of the wealthiest places in the, in the country. No. Um. So our next fixtures: Watford away in the Premier League. This is big. Watford are the, a little bit floundering. These they've lost six of their last seven. Well, they've lost six of their last seven for the FA Cup match on yeah. Saturday, and they beat a lower a Bristol Rovers three 0 maybe Bristol City. I can't remember which one. Um. I think the next Bristol four. The one. next four league games are it. These are these yeah. games. Yeah. No. I. Yeah. But if you look who we've got, we'll talk about it. But. So, so, so let, let's run through this. Watford away, definitely winnable. We won their last season 4-3. We, we, owe, them, we owe them a kicking for they did to us at St Mary's. Yeah. Um, the kind of glamour around Marco Silva, is the, the, the shine is looking the lustre. like it needs a bit of buff, doesn't it? You know, you need to get the brasso out on him. Is that a silver pun? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, um, it's good if it is. We've got, yes... <laughs> I mean, silver, brass, I mean, yeah, I think it's, it's, let's, let's roll with it. Let's say that was intentional. Um, this this is a winnable fixture and it's really, really important. They and, have and, to and This is the last win. time I saw Redmond play brilliant football. Yeah, he's got that great goal. Yeah. Oh, that was a great goal. Great Ward team Prowse, goal. Great team goal. Tadic, Ward Prowse, Redmond linking yeah. up. I, we've got to win. Like yeah. there, is, there is no way that we can walk away from that with anything less than a point. Uh, we have to win. Um Simple as that. Like this is a game where the opposition is there for the taking. They've got nothing to play for. Um, we have to win. I've seen must win being said about Palace at home, about Huddersfield at home. You know, just from recent, recent away. fixtures. So, I mean, how many times do we have to lose or draw a must win game? And I mean, I I think we see Ralph Kruger says Pellegrino is not going to go. I think at the maybe in the summer. Yeah, we, we might see something happen. So Watford away, what do we need to do to beat this Watford side? Is it going to be the Saints side that kind of sets up quite defensively and looks to attack on the break, perhaps like we would do against a Manchester City or Manchester United? Or is this a Saints that's perhaps a bit more positive? I mean, what what's his selection going to be? Who knows? I mean, I, again, I'll... I'll um, you know, the, the, the brilliant uh, post I was talking about earlier from... Um, Mush. Shirley Mush. Shirley Mush. Sorry, my memory is terrible. Uh, you know, he has a fantastic paragraph in that where he talks about the last few games. What we've been at? 5 4 1, uh, you know, 3 5 2, 4 4 2, 4 2. Like, yeah. you know, like, there are there many permutations of numbers that add up to 11, uh, numbers that add up to 10 you can get, and we all have played it at some point. Who knows what he's going to do? The only good thing is he's had a week's rest. Yeah. Um, you would hope that. Maybe Suarez might be back in contention because Bednarek, uh, you know, had a pretty solid game on Saturday. But I think with all respect to him, he's clearly a centre-back operating a mm-hmm. right-back and operating a right-back. He is very limited. He gives you nothing going forward. Or Pierre might be fit again. Um, who knows what Pellegrini... I mean, like, I, I'm not being melodramatic. You literally have no idea. I mean, he might call us up for all... You know, you never know. <laughs> I mean, he's actually seen me play. So, oh, he has actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen for oh, me. Um, I'm an unknown quantity. Mind you, you know, he's he's seen many players play this season who've not been deserving of the call ups that they've had. I'd quite like to see him, you know, just try and get a bit of consistency, build some consistency in the team. Maybe use the same setup as we did against Watford. It's Fulham. Uh, against Fulham, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Use the same setup we used against Fulham against Watford, and you know well, see, that was a good team. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you'd you'd lose Bednarek. I think I think you yeah, yeah you I mean, would. I think if it, if you but there weren't many other Bednarek, changes no. I'd make to be honest. I think it's probably a first choice Saints team at the moment. It's, it's quite well balanced. Um, Shane Long found the back of the net against uh, Fulham without it counting, but it was very very close. It was a good finish, and he scored in his last game. So you know, perhaps we're on a bit of a Shane Long run now. He deserves a chance. Yeah. Um, we don't have Spurs at home. I think you know this is probably a write-off. They're 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 much much better side than we are. Yeah, and they've just got in Harry Kane. I mean, like, what do you do? What do you what, what do you do about Harry Kane? He's going to score. It's horribly inevitable. If he doesn't score, Ericsson will. If Ericsson doesn't score, Ali does. And if Ali doesn't, Son does. 
Like, if well, Son doesn't, then maybe Lorente will come off the bench. Yeah, and, and, and nip a header. But I, so what do you do? How do you stop that? Yeah. Um, I mean, Pochettino, great manager. Spurs done really well. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the one that got away. That's the... Uh, it's the one that hurts. Yeah. Um, then we have Watford at home in the FA Cup. We're going to win the Cup, so that's fine. <laughs> so that one's bad. We were there on Saturday. We're going to win. Um, and then we've got Brighton at home. So that's Again, really, big, really important, isn't it? Mega game. Midweek, under the lights... It's got one all written all over it. Um, yeah. So, and, and when you say one all written all over it, is that one all with Saints perhaps going in the lead? Yeah, and I'd then say so. conceding to a headed goal from perhaps... Glenn Murray, you know, maybe. Glenn Murray. Yeah, You know, I with him being so. unmarked in the box or, or perhaps marked by a player. Or peeling off onto Suarez, yeah, maybe. You know, uh, yeah, I don't know. These are, these are, we're getting into, you know, the, the cliches, the business yeah. end of the season, but these games are huge. And yeah. um, these next, the four league games we have will define... Yeah. Uh, this so season. I mean, the other league game we're talking about is West Brom, isn't it? Away, but again, a huge game. Yeah. You know, they're not showing. They beat um, a very like a, what looked like a almost semi-professional extra team managed by a former Saint Paul Tisdale at the weekend. Yeah. Um, but again, like they're not doing anything. They're, oh, it's, isn't it? You know, so yeah, it's, it's pards. Uh, there's history there. We've got Jay Rodriguez. We've got again. We've got to go. Like you can imagine, right? And again, I'm always horribly optimistic. If we can get. Uh, those three games I just spoke about, two wins, three league games. If we can get two wins, they'll go to West Brom thinking they can win. Yeah. If they get two draws and a loss, then we are still in big, big trouble. I mean, we we, we are in big, big trouble at the moment, aren't we? We're above relegation yeah. on goal difference alone. Strange things can happen in football. You need to have a really, really serious cushion between yourselves and the the relegation zone when you're going into the last four or five games this season. We've seen Saints sides that have not been up to much suddenly string together four or five results right at the end of the season and save themselves back in the 90s. It happens a lot, and, and, and it could happen this season. I'd much rather if we can get the five or six wins that we're going to need to ensure survival as soon as possible. Yeah, and I think my concern is that we appear to be in a real funk Mm. There's no doubt about that. But whereas everyone else seems to be everyone recovering. Just, just picking up a little bit. Yeah, Palace come beat us. Yeah. Swansea win away. Uh, no, sorry. Swansea win, I think, with a last minute winner last weekend, in the, the weekend before in the Premier League. Uh, West Ham picking up points. Going, mm. to, going, to, going to Wembley and picking up a point. Um, Stoke still terrible. I mean, but, but they've just sacked their manager. But they've just sacked their manager. So who knows how the players are going to react. So... And, my worry is is that like the, like if you were doing like vital signs of everyone else mm. aren't, and you know if this was alien and we all had things strapped to us we would look the least positive we're still on the slide yeah, and I think a lot doubt. of the other teams are on the resurgence I think we've got a better squad than, than most of the teams in the bottom half of the table we have an like, if you look at our squad on paper we have an unbelievable team and why are we anywhere near? Why are we even having this conversation? It's insane that the management there has not been able to get much better out of these players. Is it also insane that Saints are almost certainly not going to sack Pellegrino anytime soon? I, I don't think that is insane. because so at, at what point does it become insane? Let's say, worst case scenario, we lose at Watford away. And it's a pretty pathetic... We lose 3-0. It's not unrealistic. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine it would maybe be a 2-1 or a 2-0 to Watford. So I'm going for the worst case scenario. Spurs, we pull off an impressive 0-0. Yep. Um, that would be very impressive. And then Brighton at home is perhaps a draw. A one all. So from these three points where really you want to be looking at either six or four points, I think, from those three games, and you end up with two is that the point when you change the manager? They're not going to fire him. Like we can talk about this till till the cows come home. Like they are not going to fire him. Like the the Kruger interview. At, at, at some point, Mister Gow comes in and says, "I've invested two hundred million pounds in this club, right? And the reason I've invested two hundred million pounds is because I'm expecting to get one hundred thirty million pounds at the start of next season." Another £130 million at the start of the season after that. And then when the new TV deal comes in, I'm expecting to get £200 million every season. He's not invested £200 million in the club for us to go down to the championship. Yeah, but the club's 
At yeah, some but, point, yeah, but as long as they don't go to the championship. At some point, he's going to step in. But the crazy thing about Premier League money, right, is it doesn't matter really where you finish. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, as the long matter, as you're in the As division. long as you're in the division. Like, it, Saints can finish four from bottom and generate a very healthy return for the mysterious Mr. Gow. But I reckon two points out of the next three games, which is two draws, it's only one loss. Um, that's league games we're talking about. Yeah. And can you make a case that Saints won't get relegated? No, Saints will get... I mean, I think there's a very good chance that well, Saints I mean, are going to get relegated. What do you reckon the... You know, is it 50-50 between us getting relegated? I would say it, there, I, would, I would say there is a 30% chance we would get relegated. Yeah. I, I, I do believe it. I, I'm not being melodramatic. I think that, as we've said, other teams look like they think they can maybe get out of this. Mm. Uh, we do not. We have no vital signs that I would say are positive right now. We are kind of, we're stable, but there is no real reasons to be cheerful. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's about a 30% chance we'll get relegated. And then I think, of course, then they will look to change the manager, um, I imagine. But because how many managers survive getting relegated? Not many. Um, but I, 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 I don't. Th- I think the whole football model has gone so mad yeah. that staying in the Premier League is what matters. You know, yeah. you see teams consistently. That's why Bournemouth will put out a weakened team in the FA Cup. The only competition that they've got any chance of winning yeah. or getting any glory in, and they put out a weakened team at home again against Bolton. Like, but that's because they have to. They, they do the numbers. They have to stay in the league. Yeah. And getting to quarterfinals of the FA Cup gets you nothing. Getting fourth from bottom in the Premier League gets you 130 million. What would you do? Well, I mean, if you're a football fan, I mean, this is this is the age old question, isn't it? What would you rather? Would you rather Saints won the FA Cup and got relegated? Yeah. Or would you rather that they stayed in the Premier League and and did nothing? I've i I've, I've never seen them win anything. I'm 36. Apart from the Johnson's Pain Trophy. Apart from the Johnson's Pain Trophy. Um, I've never seen him win a major trophy. Um, Yeah, I'm 36 years old. My dad is 58. He's seen him win the FA Cup, but he's 58 and that's all he's seen. Um, Yeah, you know, like, I, I, of course you would. Like, you get, you get out of the championship. But the owners wouldn't. Yeah. And that's, football's mad. Yeah. But football's a business. So, anyway, on that note, I mean, we've been wittering on for a little bit longer than we normally do. Um, there's a few things that I think uh, Saints fans should check out. Shirley Mush, um, yeah, it's a great read on St Mary's Musings was very, very good. Um, also, you may have spotted Tom Parker on the Ugly Inside. We met up with Freddie in the pub after the film <laughs> game, and um, Tom, you. you, you Gave your thoughts after the Fulham game on that. Say, so, I mean, get on there, leave some some comments. About Be nice. Tom. Yeah. Um, my friend said I'm the only person on video ever to have red eye. Uh, I look quite gaunt on, on video. So, um, yeah. And uh, I mean, one of the comments said, "Get this guy on more often." So you know. Match of the day too. I am available. Are you, you going to be having a big money transfer from the Saints FC podcast to, to the, the Arsenal inside? or to the Arsenal Arsenal fan Arsenal TV? TV. <laughs> Do a swap for Walcott. Um, and also the other thing is uh, earlier today I, had, I was very fortunate I managed to speak to Paul Jones yes um, Saints number one goalkeeper for five years so do look out for that that interview will be coming out soon once I get around to the chance to edit it and if you haven't to listened to sorry if you haven't listened to the Michael Svensson interview I thoroughly recommend that because he is very interesting yeah and John you did a great job of speaking to Michael Svensson I have to say yeah well th- I mean thanks for, for your comments Tom um Anyway, that's all we've got time for. Um, if you are still listening at this point in the podcast... You've done um, well. Yeah, I'm very impressed. You've, you've lasted well over the hour. Um, thank you very, very much for sticking with us. Do send us your, your co- comments and correspondence. We do love, absolutely love hearing from you. Of course, leave us a review on iTunes if you fancy. We're on Twitter at Saints FC Podcast. We're on email, Podcast at gmail.com. Um, and, I, you know, I suppose that's it from me. So... um. Thanks for listening. Yeah, cheerio. Cheers.